Welcome everyone. I think we are ready to start our first edition of Astronomy on, type, on Tap in St. Louis online. I want to thank you for uh, tuning in today for this special event in these uh, difficult times, but hopefully you can enjoy this hour of science uh, staying at home. So first of all, uh, I would like to thank uh, our sponsors, Washington University in St. Louis, the Department of Physics of Washington University in St. Louis. I would like to thank uh, Urban Chestnut uh, Brewing Company here in, in St. Louis and uh, our partners, the Academy of Science uh, of St. Louis. Uh, they also have a lot of outreach events and even on online outreach events like this one. So I encourage you to go to their websites and, and check them out. And uh, finally, this is a program that is also supported by the JPL, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory outreach program called Solar System Ambassadors. For uh, those of us who are uh, looking at us in anywhere in the US, this is a national program where people uh, conduct outreach events. So I also encourage you to look them up and see if there's something near to, to where you are. And then finally, I also encourage you to uh, check our social media on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter, and uh, also of our part events, Science the Steel, that uh, will take place uh, next month. So first, uh, I would like to introduce myself. I'm a researcher from uh, Princeton University, and I work for the Vera Ruin Observatory. And um, my partner, Dr. Alex Howard, my name is uh, Dr. Andres Plazas, and my, uh, my friend and partner, Dr. Alex Howard, he works for the Department of Physics of Washington University in St. Louis. So today we have uh, two special guests, and uh, what we're going to do is that we're going to have uh, these two talks. Each, each one of them is going to be about 20 minutes. Um, then usually in between when we're at the bar, we have quizzes and trivia and everything, and we have fun in person, but uh, with this time, of course, we're not going to be able to do that. So we're just going to go straight to the second talk. But in the meantime, uh, while our speakers are, are talking, uh, we encourage you to write your questions on the YouTube chat. And then at the end of the talk, we're going to uh, transmit those questions to our speakers. So without further ado, uh, I'm gonna, I would like to introduce our first uh, speaker of the night. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and maybe Kirsten, you can start sharing yours. So our first speaker of the night is uh, Dr. Kirsten Sivach. She is an assistant professor in the Rice University Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences. And uh, um, and she, and she calls herself a Martian geologist. Her research focuses on interpreting the history of water and the surface environments early in our solar system. And she is currently a member of the science and operations teams for the Mars Science Laboratory, Robert Curiosity. And previously, she has worked on the science and engineering teams for the Phoenix Lander and the two Mars exploration rovers. Dr. Siva completed completed her PhD in geology at Caltech and then did a postdoctoral research in geochemistry of Martian sediments at the Stony Brook University. And before Caltech, she attended Washington University in St. Louis, where she graduated in earth and planetary science in, in chemistry. She is also actively engaged in promoting education and outreach related to earth and planetary science and regularly presents at schools and outreach events, such as this one. And outside of professional interests, she loves to travel. She loves photography on Earth and well as Mars. And she enjoys swimming, hiking, and very importantly, social distancing. So thank you so much again for being with us tonight. And uh, I'm going to uh, let you continue with your talk, Dr. Sierra. All right. Well, thank you for that introduction. And thanks for the opportunity um, to speak to uh, the folks online. <laughs> so thanks for logging into YouTube. Um, I'm going to be talking about some of the experiences driving the Curiosity rover and kind of focus in on some of our biggest discoveries and uh, what it is that we're kind of looking at on a day to day basis. Um, so to start, uh, go back to uh, go back to the big picture. And so Mars is the next planet out from the sun. <laughs> it's quite cold and dry and very barren today. 
Um, it doesn't have a protective magnetic field, and so it's lost much of its atmosphere. And it doesn't have plate tectonics, so much of the surface is quite ancient. When we first got pictures of all of Mars, we could see that it was dry and barren with just a bit of ice at the two poles. And we were initially pretty disappointed. We had been hoping for a long time that Mars would have uh, signs of life, that Mars might have a civilization or might have um, modern activity. And instead we found that today it's, it's pretty dry. It's mostly just the wind blowing dust across the surface. But when we looked closer and got higher resolution imagery, we could see that there are a number of ancient channels uh, crisscrossing the Martian surface that show where water used to flow in the past. And some of these are fairly small. Some of them are quite large, uh, up to basically what would cross the United States. Um, but these channels show us that, that there used to be a lot more activity of water. And, and because of the lack of plate tectonics and the lack of activity on Mars, um, these are preserved from very ancient times. And so when we think about really ancient times, like maybe 4 billion years ago, uh, Earth and Mars might have actually been quite comparable. And in that time, we can almost think of Earth as a foreign planet uh, that we want to understand more about. If I, if I put that on a timeline, right, billions of years ago, both Earth and Mars formed about four and a half billion years ago. Um, now, since then, Earth has changed dramatically. More than just over two billion years ago, we, we got atmospheric oxygen. Um, and because of plate tectonics, much of the surface of Earth is constantly recycling itself. And so most of Earth's surface represents the last billion years of change. What we do know on Earth, as we look for fossils and look for evidence of ancient life, is that life probably started somewhere around between three and four billion years ago. Now, that time period is actually extremely well preserved on Mars. Most of the Martian surface is from about three to four billion years ago. And during that time on Mars, uh, there was a transition between uh, clays or times when Mars was more wet, salts as Mars probably dried up, and, and the dry Mars that we see today where the wind is the most active geological agent on the surface. Um, and so we're really interested in these kind of major climatic transitions on Mars. They'll tell us about that time when life evolved on Earth and uh, major climate changes on a planet that maybe was once very similar to ours. And so we send rovers to investigate the surface. Uh, the Curiosity rover is the one that I'll be talking the most about. The Curiosity rover landed on Mars on August 5th, 2012. It's operated out of the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, but also by a team of scientists distributed around the world. There's about 400 to 500 scientists who operate this mission. Um, it's about the size of a small SUV, so you can picture it kind of taking up a, a full parking spot. Uh, and it's got 11 different science instruments, and I'll talk about a couple of them, but the one in this slide that you can see pretty clearly is this very strong laser. And so this laser um, shoots out of the, the mast of Curiosity and can zap rocks between seven feet and about 20 feet away from the rover and turns a very small spot into a plasma and then tells us what the composition of the rock is in that very small um, laser spot. So. Um, one thing that you have to think about when you're landing a, a car on Mars is you only get to visit one spot on the planet and that it can be a challenge to interpret the history of an entire planet from one spot. In fact, it's, it's extremely difficult, but we try to pick a spot that will tell us something about uh, the story of the history of Mars that we, that we understand. Um, and so, let's see, so for the Curiosity rover, and uh, we visited, we chose to visit Gale Crater. Gale Crater is about 155 kilometers across or 110 miles across. And it's a big crater um, that formed about 3.8 billion years ago. That was when an impactor hit the planet so hard that the middle of the crater actually rebounded up. So this pointy area is the central peak of the crater. Um, since then, much of this filled with sediment and later was eroded by the wind. We know the wind is an active agent even today. 
the wind is blowing in from this direction and it's blowing this dark sand all the way around the mountain and actually out the back of the crater. Um, this circle right here is where we tried to land Curiosity. And our goal was to investigate the layers on this mountain called Mount Sharp that surrounds the central peak of the crater. Now, they, we picked this spot because we could see from orbit that these layers have mineral signatures that represent those major transitions in Mars climate history. So we go from clays to salts to dusty materials. Um, and so when we actually landed there in 2012, one of the first things we did was sit in this spot right around the center, right where we landed and look over at that mountain. And to get these pictures of Mars and get this real perspective is really just one of the most exciting parts of working on one of these missions, to get these pictures from the ground, um, to see another planet just like we would see Earth. And we do adjust these images so that the sky looks blue so that the colors of the rocks are similar to what they would be if we saw the same rocks on Earth. Now, again, we can see those transitions from wet Mars to drying Mars to dry Mars. Uh, and so that's where we wanted to head to go see what was going on. We did go a little bit in a different direction at first. Um, one of the first things we saw were these rocks, we call these conglomerates. Uh, they're cemented rocks that contain pebbles from different origins. Um, but what we were excited about is that those pebbles in this case are rounded. And so if we have round rocks that have been cemented together, you can see several round pebbles in here. Um, and we know they're from a river. Uh, rounded grains of this size are probably from a river. And so this river would have been about knee deep um, rushing across the Martian surface. And so this was one of the first evidences from the ground that we had water rushing across the surface. And so we kind of we deviated from our main course towards the mountain and looked over. We found a few more rocks that showed layering that shows that they were deposited in rivers. And we kind of followed those down to the lowest topography we could find. Um, and I have a little bit of a giveaway here, but this is the lowest topography spot that we found in Gale Crater, right on the outside, kind of in the, in the moat around the main mountain in the crater. Um, and as soon as we got here to this flat layer, we decided to pull out all of our analytical instruments. So we stopped Curiosity, we stopped this car-sized rover and tried dr drilling into the ground. Um, just to give you a sense, we have a whole lot of different instruments. We can zap the rocks with that laser. That'll give us the, the chemistry of very small spots. We also have an instrument on the end of the rover arm that can get the chemistry of a larger spot. It's called alpha particle x-ray spectrometer, and that spot's about the size of a penny. If we rotate the arm, then we can drill into the rock. And that's what we did in this, in this light-toned mudstone. And those, those drill holes are, again, about the size of an American penny. And here's that drill hole. It's about five centimeters deep. We drilled into what looks like red rock, just like the rest of Mars. But when we drilled it, the powder was gray. And that was really exciting to us because Mars is red all the time. <laughs> and it's red because it's oxidized iron. But gray rocks usually have reduced iron. The difference between oxidized iron and reduced iron is energy that we know that microbes can use on Earth um, to sustain life. And so we were excited that there were chemical gradients required for life. Now, we were also able to look at these, these samples with, uh, with the XRD, which is a kind of X-ray based instrument that reflects X-rays off the powder uh, to tell you what minerals are in the rock. And we were able to heat the rock up in an oven um, and see what kind of uh, volatile compounds came off. What we learned from that was that this rock is about 25 or 30% clay, uh, clay minerals, which form in water. And a lot of that water actually came out of the layers of clay. And so clay is the layered mineral. When you heat it up, you can release the volatiles that are trapped in between the layers of the clay. And we can see what the chemistry of the lake was like. Now, our conclusion from that was that this lake, this area that we drilled into, was actually a lake that would have been habitable for Earth-like life about three and a half billion years ago when it formed. Um, so that means it had all of the components required for life. It had liquid water. It sustained that liquid water for an extended period of time. 
It had all of the chemicals required for life, all of the elements that we typically see in organisms on Earth. It had favorable conditions. There wasn't, uh, it wasn't super acidic or super basic or super salty. Um, instead, it was a clement lake that, um, and then it had energy for life. I told you about the different forms of iron. And so this is one of the major discoveries on Mars in probably the last decade is that Mars actually had places three and a half billion years ago where life could have survived. Life would have been happy. Um, that's around the time when life formed on Earth. And so it could have formed on Mars, right? So this is, we haven't found evidence for life, but we now know that Mars really did have the conditions ready to support life if it had existed about three and a half million years ago. One more finding since this time is that at least one of the drill holes we drilled into this rock actually did have um, organic molecules or carbon bound to hydrogen uh, molecules. And so those molecules actually survived from three and a half billion years ago. And so not only did Mars have habitable environments, but it had environments where um, organic molecules may have survived. And so this makes Mars an even more exciting place to keep investigating and keep understanding kind of what those times were like early in the history of both planets. Um, after we saw that, we decided to dr drive over to the, to the mountain quickly. And so we looked back at those layers and they're just so beautiful. All of these great layers of rock. We know that when we see layered rocks like this, we can tell the story of what happened in past environments by starting from the bottom or the oldest rock and looking at each layer to understand progressively younger or more recent environments. So we started driving really quickly. Um, unfortunately, about mm, a couple, about a hundred days later, we looked down at our wheels and uh, saw that there were actually holes in the wheels. <laughs> now, these holes right over here, these are intentional, um, but these holes were not intentional. Uh, the wheels were designed to be really thin aluminum so that they would have maximum surface area so that we could drive and get out of like a sand dune if we got stuck. And also so that the rover would weigh less and we could put more of that weight into the science instruments. Now, unfortunately, it turns out the rocks on Mars, having been carved by the wind for billions of years, are relatively pointy. <laughs> and so they were a lot harder and a lot sharper than we thought they would be. Um, when something like this happens to your car on Earth, you could take it to a mechanic. But since we've got a car on Mars, we can't fix it. And so we have to figure out ways to drive more carefully um, and avoid as many rocks as we can <laughs> uh, and avoid having this happen. One other point I wanted to make on this slide is just that these wheels, these holes that are intentional are meant to be a tracer for how many times the wheel has rotated. And uh, they actually spell out JPL in Morse code. So NASA, NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory decided to brand Mars <laughs> by putting JPL across the surface each time these wheels rotated. Um, so those, those holes were intentional. Uh, when you think of driving a car on a road trip, if you had 400 scientists in your car and there were no highways, um, then even when you have a specific requirement, like try to avoid driving over a lot of small rocks, uh, if you ask five different experts, this is an actual slide from one of our discussions, how to get from A to B, um, you may see about seven different paths, um, you know, at least one of which doesn't end at B. Right, so, so working with a team of 400, 500 scientists around the world tends to look like this. But at the same time, it's really exciting to have so many different opinions and so many different ideas and backgrounds that come together in order to make decisions every day about what the rover will do um, as we continue to traverse the surface. Um, and so what do we do? We keep putting together these stories. And so we understood that first lake and we drove across some more rivers these are actually the same rivers. These are rivers kind of turning down up on the top part mosaic. And actually, you're kind of sitting right over here with the rover looking this way for the second mosaic. So you see the rivers dipping away from you. Um, if you want kind of a visual, these are rivers going down into a lake. So we drove over this way to find the lake. 
and indeed we found extensive lake sediments. And so I'll show you just a little video clip to tell you the story of the crater that we've put together from the geology we've seen so far. Four billion years ago, you're on Mars, <laughs> there's a bunch of volcanic rocks. 3.8 billion years ago, there was that major impact that created the central peak in the middle of the crater. And what you see here is some groundwater filling in, and there's also water flowing in from the edge of the crater. Now that water is gonna carry pebbles, and sand and mud. And it's going to keep flowing in and depositing that sediment. Um, this lake lasted an incredibly long period of time, probably tens of millions of years based on the sediments we've seen at this point. Now at some point it did shut off and we think the rest of the crater just filled with windblown um, sand and dust. And so a lot of the crater probably filled up with sand and dust and wind. Uh, later, for some reason, the wind changed and the new wind in this area caused erosion. And so there was erosion, not only of the layers deposited by wind, but also of the layers originally deposited with sand and conglomerates, pebbles and mud. Further, more water kind of flushed in through fractures. We think the water continued until at least 2 billion years ago. And then in about 2012, a rover showed up to investigate these layers. And so we've been driving through these mudstone layers um, for the past seven years investigating this part of Mars. Um, as we do that, whoops, next slide. Uh, we continuously, we try to take drill holes whenever we can, sample the rock and understand how the lake is changing. We also take selfies whenever we can, especially when we drill a hole because we're really proud of ourselves and everyone takes a selfie when they're proud of themselves and their accomplishments. Um, so this is the rover taking a selfie um, as it's been driving up the mudstone. The selfie is actually from a camera on the end of the arm, which has to turn around and take a whole bunch of pictures to actually cover the entire rover. So that's why the selfie ends up not having an arm, but the rover has an arm. Um, we have at this point taken a whole lot of drilled samples and we're still tracing out the full history of this lake. But what it looks like is that there was a lake fairly continuously for millions of years, most likely, um, about 400 meters of sediment uh, stacked vertically. Um, and that lake appears to have been habitable for the vast majority of the time it was there. In fact, there are sometimes kind of higher up in the, in, the, in the lake sediments that look like they were even warmer than the first lake that we saw. And so we continue to investigate. This is a picture that we just took this week. Uh, you can follow along. All of the pictures are made available um, to the public as fast as they're available to us. And so you can follow along on the MSL homepage. And one more thing to look forward to is that in July, the Perseverance rover will be launching for Mars. Um, the Perseverance rover has the same size body as Curiosity. It's also about the size of a small SUV, fill a parking spot. Um, and it'll be launching for Mars. It'll be landing in Jezero Crater, which is shown here. This is the wall of the crater, and this is a river that's coming in that breached the wall of the crater and came in and actually spread out its sediments in a way that tells us that this crater was full of a lake. And so there was again a lake on Mars, there was again a river entering that lake, and these sediments were stacked rapidly enough that they might preserve any evidence for life that might have been upstream or in the lake here. So we're excited to sample those. Perseverance is actually step one of a series of missions. Perseverance will sample, take about two or three dozen pinky sized cores of rock and put them in sealed tubes. And Perseverance will leave those sealed tubes on the surface of Mars. Another mission will come in probably the late 2020s uh, and collect all of the sample tubes and send them, launch them into orbit around Mars. At which point a third mission that has come straight from Earth will grab the sample tube package from orbit around Mars and bring it back straight back to Earth. That mission doesn't have to land on Mars. And so that's part of the reason for the three part series. But we're excited that um, especially if there's any students listening, uh, you guys will potentially have samples selected carefully on Mars to actually work with here on Earth. We have so much more analytical capacity here on Earth. And so those samples will provide new insights into the Martian surface for years to come. 
Um, so we're looking forward to that. Look forward to the launch window this coming up this summer and the landing uh, next next winter. And with that, I'll pause for questions. Um, thanks for listening. Thank you so much for your talk. That was really fascinating. We already have some questions coming in. So Veronica Howell wants to know, what is the biggest challenge to landing humans on Mars? Uh, let's see. So one of the biggest challenges is the radiation that they will have to endure during both the trip to Mars and on the surface of Mars. The trip to Mars would take probably about, well, the trip itself would take six to nine months. Um, but because of kind of the orbits of Earth and Mars, your mission would be a minimum of two years. And during that time, the astronauts would be exposed to a lot of radiation. So there are still science and engineering challenges besides that one. But one of the biggest challenges for humans uh, going will be the radiation that those humans will have to, that we need to find a way to protect them um, from that level of radiation. One other thing is we want to protect Mars from being too contaminated by Earth organisms um, to find evidence if there was ancient Martian life. Uh, so there's a couple different, those are a couple things to think about, but there's actually, there's a few other science and engineering challenges. I would just say radiation is the biggest issue. Um, we have another question that I think you have partially answered at the end of your talk, but I'm going to um, read it to you anyway. Um, what are some of the future plans for sampling on Mars and looking for signatures of life? Yeah, the Perseverance rover is our next uh, big project for sure. Um, but that will, that comes with, uh, so that's the next step is collecting those samples and trying to bring them back to Earth. The Perseverance rover will also have some instruments to analyze samples um, on the planet. And so that'll help us select the right samples and also learn more from that mission. And then we hope there will be more missions. We don't have any more funded um, projects that are moving forward right now. Another question we have, uh, did Mars have a period of heavy meteor bombardment like the moon and the earth? Yeah, great question. So there was a period of heavy meteor bombardment um, early in solar system history and Mars definitely experienced uh, significant impacts from that time period. Mars is very close to the asteroid belt, and so it may have even experienced a more dramatic heavy bombardment um, than the moon. But we use this, the chronology we got from the moon um, in order to get relative dates for the different surfaces we see on Mars, uh, taking into account that bombardment because it's near the asteroid belt. Then we have another question. Is the water on Mars liquid or ice? Today it is all ice and there's a little bit in the atmosphere. So today it is all ice and gas. The pressure of the atmosphere on Mars is so low that liquid water is not stable. So I also have a question. I know you talked about a different rover, but one of the funniest things I read in the past was when Inside had to hit himself with itself with a shovel to to dig itself free. So I think the question we all have, is it doing okay? Uh, from what I have heard, I've also been following along with that story, but uh, Insight has been, Insight is a lander, so it's not moving around, but it is trying to, to bury a probe that will be able to measure the temperature as it kind of dips down into Mars. But it has encountered a number of challenges with getting that probe to the depth it wanted. Um, and like you said, it used this technique where it kind of used the back of its hand um, on the on the cord for that probe <laughs> to try to help it get a little more ground, deep, get a little deeper into the ground. Um, I don't think it has reached the, the desired depth at this point. We'll keep hoping. <laughs> so we actually have more questions coming in right now. So does Perseverance has different cap uh, capabilities than Curiosity? Will it be more capable to find traces of biomolecules biomole or other signs of simple life? In some ways, yes. So the instruments on Perseverance are more designed to look for um, organic molecules that are that are at the surface and visible. It has a Raman spectrometer, and it has a stronger or it has a newly developed laser instrument similar to Curiosity. Um, in other ways, 
not as much. So it's, it's, it's a balance. So Perseverance's instruments are designed to be able to kind of survey different areas of the ground and help us pick the optimal sample for drilling and saving. Curiosity was designed as a laboratory. And so that instrument that allows us to detect the mineralogy and the instrument that allows us to heat up the samples and look at what volatile molecules come off like water and carbon dioxide and um, different salts uh, are, are big instruments that don't fit on Perseverance because Perseverance is saving that room for making the for preserving new samples. But Perseverance has these kind of mappers, so it'll be able to make a little micro map about the size of a postage stamp of the elements and any organics in the rock um, at that postage stamp scale. And we'll probably take a few postage stamp pictures with this Raman spectrometer and XRF mapper um, so that we can figure out the best spot to sample. So one person just asked for your personal gut feeling, was there ever some form of life on Mars? My personal gut feeling is, let's see, it's tricky. I think that there very well could have been. And I think that Mars is probably one of the easiest places for us to be able to look. Um, I think Mars was definitely in the habitable zone and definitely habitable at the same time as Earth. Uh, I think there could definitely be life somewhere in the universe. Um, I think, so I think Mars is kind of our best bet. And so I'm hoping <laughs> that we can find, um, I've actually, I will say I have become more convinced that it would be possible to find that kind of evidence on Mars because of this mission, because we have found organic molecules. We have found carbon bound hydrogen, organic type molecules in, in the sediments. And so, I am still waiting to see, but I am definitely still hoping. <laughs> it drives my it drives my research is, is kind of asking these questions. I, one other point, now I'm rambling, but one other point is that um, the other side is that Mars gives us this chance to see what geology and what atmospheres and what planets could be like without life. And so the other side is that we've never had an example. When we're on Earth, everything we see has been affected by life. Um, from the atmosphere to the way that rivers flow, um, to the minerals that we form, um, everything has been affected by life. And so in some ways, I would, I'm absolutely excited and looking for life on Mars and definitely looking as we, as we get to investigate more exoplanets. But in other ways, I think it's really cool that we have the chance to look at a planet that isn't so dominated by life and try to understand what the real influences of life on our planet are. So one user asks, uh, what happened to the early water? Did it all evaporate out of Mars gravity well? Was it blown away by the solar wind? A lot of it was blown away by the solar wind. Um, and some of it might be locked in the rock record. So when we're looking at these ancient clays and heating them up, we are finding water. And if there's even just a little bit of water, but it's spread all over the planet, um, in those ancient records, then that could have also helped take some of the water out of the atmosphere. And without plate tectonics and volcanoes to refresh it, um, you can lose water both to the surface bound to the rocks and out to space because there's no magnetic field. Okay, we have two more questions before we have to go to the next talk. So um, one question is, what is the time difference between commands from Earth and then the action of the rover on Mars? Mm, good question. Uh, so it's it's about, uh, it, depending on Earth and Mars respective orbits, there can be a five minute delay to about a 30 minute delay, uh, just in terms of the speed of light to actually get the command to Mars. But in reality, we're sending the, the commands to satellites orbiting around Mars, which then communicate with the rover directly. Um, and so because of that, we still only get, we only get the chance to communicate with it basically a few times a day. And so we send up orders to tell the rover what to do for one to three days at a time. Three days at a time is really just so we can have a weekend, but we, we do at least a full day at a time because we only get a few chances to send that signal. Everybody needs a weekend from time to time, even a mass rover. So as a last question, how high up uh, Mount Sharp do you expect to attain? We are just planning some of that now. We are just kind of approaching where from orbit we saw the clay signature and, or sorry, the clay, we're currently where we saw the clay signature and we're approaching where we saw the, 
the salt signature, the sulfate signature, and looking at that drying out process and kind of what that actually looks like in the geologic record. Um, all of that will probably only still take us, um, we're maybe 400 meters above the crater floor right now, vertical elevation, and we'll maybe get another 100 or so. We've got a lot of rocks to investigate and a lot of things we'll want to drill along the way. Um, the, the full mountain is actually about four and a half kilometers high. And so it's actually a very large mountain and we won't get to the top of the mountain at all. Okay, thanks. Thanks you so much for your great and fascinating talk. It was really super interesting. And I will turn over to Andres that he can introduce our second talk. Thank you so much, Dr. Sivak. That was very interesting. And uh, I am myself learning a lot as a cosmologist, and I'm pretty sure our viewers are also learning a lot. But uh, now we're going to continue with our grand tour of the solar system with our next speaker. So for our second talk of the night, we have Dr. Ryan Watkins. Um, she's a research scientist with the Planetary Science Institute, and, uh, is on, and she is on the Science Advisory Board for Blue Origins Blue Moon Land Project. Her research focuses on integrating remote sensing data sets to characterize the physical and compositional properties of airless bodies, with particular emphasis on the lunar surface. She specializes in using photometry to understand physical and compositional properties of planetary surfaces, and in integrating planetary data sets to assess landing site safety hazards for future missions. Dr. Watkins obtained degrees in physics and space science from the Florida Institute of Technology in 2010 and her PhD in Earth and Planetary Science from Washington University in St. Louis in 2015. And before joining the Planetary Science Institute as a research scientist, she served as a postdoctoral research associate at Washington University in St. Louis. So uh, please, uh, Dr. Watkins, go ahead. And All right. Well, thank you. It's, uh, it's good to be here again, actually, uh, even though we're not in, in person this time. Um, but yes, thanks for having me. So uh, we're going to switch planetary bodies here, and um, I am going to focus on uh, the moon. So uh, the next few slides um, that I'm going to show you um, is going to be a lot of information about returning to the moon, which, you know, if you've paid any attention to the news, you know, is kind of a a big topic right now. So this is exactly what you just said. So I'm actually gonna skip over this um, and move on to why I am very interested in returning to the moon. So there's a lot of reasons really, but um, there are a lot of companies that are really looking to go to the moon right now. One of which obviously is, is Blue Origin, like, like Andres just said, um, I am on their Blue Moon uh, Science Advisory Board. So we're helping to uh, tell Blue Origin things like, um, this, these are good landing sites. We're giving them feedback on lander design. Um, but all of this is really because of the recent push, um, with, especially within the U.S., but it is an international um, effort right now to return to the moon. Uh, so uh, just a couple years ago now, um, our administration uh, released this kind of um, direct directive to send um, the U.S. back to the moon. Um, and so you can see a little quote here. Um, the, the U.S. will lead the return of humans to the moon for long-term exploration, um, followed by human missions to Mars and other destinations. So, so there's a big push right now to return um, humans to the moon by 2024 is the current timeline that they're aiming for. Um, the, it's supposed to be the first woman and the next man. So, you know, if you know anything about the Apollo program, you know that it was, it was 12 men who walked on the moon. So, so they're really pushing for the first woman. Um, and this has really kind of... Um, come out of a long series of programs that have tried to return to the moon. Um, but, but beyond just the government side, um, there is also a lot of interest from just the commercial side. So private um, entities that have been looking to get to the moon. Um, some of them originated out of a competition a few years ago called the Google Lunar X Prize. Uh, so this was kind of a competition for companies to develop landers and get to the moon by a certain date. And there was, you know, cash prizes. And um, even though none of them met that, that timeline, um, it really kind of generated this boost in companies that were interested in the moon. Um, and so the logos you're seeing over here are just a couple of those companies, Astrobotic, Blue Origin, Mastin, a few others. Uh, so 
and beyond just NASA and commercial companies, there's also a big international push for the moon. So the moon is a hot destination right now. Um, but um, you may be asking, uh, why should we go back? Uh, so there's you know a few people in the camp of you know well been there done that we obviously sent humans to the moon we brought rocks back like why do we really need to go again? Um, well, there's actually a lot of great reasons to go back to the moon. Uh, the first of which is just continued exploration. Um, so really, it's it's kind of in our human nature to explore. Uh, we've been doing it for all of you know the time that humans have existed. Um, and so it's really just kind of in our nature to continue exploring. And there's a lot of the moon that we haven't seen yet. Um, another reason is to build um, permanent or semi-permanent architecture. So living on the moon for extended durations of time, whether it be months or years or even longer, um, just really getting there and living off of our, uh, our own planet. Uh, we have a lot of unanswered scientific questions about the moon and we could spend, you know, a few more hours talking about that. So we won't really go into all of that, but there's a lot we don't know about the formation and evolution of the moon um, and, and kind of what it was like in its um, ancient past. Uh, it's really great practice for Mars. So I'm very solidly in team. Um, let's go to the moon in order to learn how to live on Mars. Uh, so there's a lot we can do with the resources on the moon, which kind of feeds directly into the next one I have there. Um, we can learn about living on another planetary body for long periods of time, being exposed to radiation, um, uh, just lots of different things, uh, developing technologies we may need to live on Mars and to, to go to Mars. Um, and going back to the resource harvesting, we can actually use um, the soil on the moon, which we call regolith. Um, we can produce things um, like water and um, uh, rocket fuel from, from the hydrogen and oxygen and different minerals that are within the rocks. Uh, so there's a lot of work being done right now to look into that. Uh, and then finally, um, international cooperation. So like I said, a lot of countries are looking to go to the moon. Um, there's India, China, Russia, um, lots of others. So it's just a really great chance for us to really come together as an international community and cooperate and um, share data. All right, so um, this is uh, the near side of the moon. So, so when you look up at the moon in the night sky, this is the side you see. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, then um, the moon is tidally locked with Earth. So we only see one side of it from Earth. Um, and this is the side we see, the near side. And here I'm showing all of the sites where we have sent spacecraft to the actual surface of the moon. So your, your yellow, or sorry, your green stars here are the surveyor missions. So these were the first set of spacecraft um, that we sent to the moon. Uh, they, as their name might suggest, were kind of surveying missions. Their kind of main um, point was to demonstrate the feasibility of doing a soft landing on the moon in preparation for Apollo. So there were uh, seven of these in total. Um, a few of them did crash, uh, but you know we've got, you can again see here, the ones that are still sitting on the surface of the moon. Uh, there's one also here um, at Apollo 12 that's not highlighted, but the, the two spacecraft were so close together, it was too much overlap. Um, and then uh, the, the blue stars here are the Apollo missions, so the ones that a lot of us are most familiar with, um, which were obviously the human missions. Uh, there were six of those. And then the red are the, the Russian Luna missions. Um, these were uh, stationary um, spacecraft, and then a few of them also had some rovers, um, and then a few of them returned samples as well. And then yellow are the more recent ones. So these are the Chinese Shanga missions. We had Shanga 3, which landed in 2013. Um, and then Shanga 4, which is on the far side and landed last year, I think 2019. So uh, now I'm going to remove the ones that were primarily technology demonstrations. Uh, so now we're left with the missions that were uh, mainly focused on science. Uh, so, you know, the Apollo missions obviously did science and then uh, the Russian and Chinese. Going a step further, and if we remove the ones that did not return samples uh, to Earth, uh, we're left with the Apollo and a couple of Russian missions. So again, these are the missions that actually picked up samples um, and brought them back to Earth. Uh, so if, when you think about that, you can see we have not actually covered very much ground here in terms of the rocks that we have analyzed on the moon um, directly, um, especially in labs on Earth. Uh, so, and a lot of these are kind of really focused the more equatorial regions of the moon. And as you can see, they're all on the near side. So if we switch over to the far side, uh, this is a side of the moon that we cannot see from Earth. You can see it looks drastically different. Uh, this is one of the unanswered questions is, is kind of why, why is all the, um, so let's go back real quick. This, the dark areas are ancient lava flows. So these are um, the mare. 
Um, and you don't see as many of those on the far side. So that's kind of a big question is why do we have this dichotomy? Um, and again, you can see we have only sent one mission to the far side. This is the Chinese Shanga 4 mission, which just landed a year ago. So we really have no ground truth data from the entire back half of the moon. All right, so again here I am showing um, the near side of the moon and the Apollo landing sites. This is overlaying on a map of the United States. And I like to show this because I, I kind of try as best I can to center Apollo 11 on St. Louis, which is where a lot of us are, at least it's where I'm at. Um, and you see, can see if you kind of move west, we, we haven't even really made it to like New Mexico, Arizona, California area. Uh, we've certainly not made it to like, you know, the East Coast. Uh, so just in terms of the actual ground distance traveled, we have not made it very far. Um, the Apollo astronauts, both on foot and in their little cars, they only traveled about 60 miles. Um, so that's not very far. I mean, that's like, you know what, a drive across town for some people if you live in a small town. Uh, but yeah, so there's a lot of ground left to cover. So this is kind of one of the really big reasons why we need to get back to the moon, because we really just have not seen a lot of it. Uh, and that leads me to what we're doing to prepare to send humans and robots, a robot, robotic spacecraft to the surface of the moon. So it turns out we've been preparing for well over a decade now. So in 2009, NASA launched a spacecraft called the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter um, to the moon. So as the name suggests, this is an orbiter. Um, it's, it's not on the surface, it just um, orbits the moon and uh, collects data. So uh, we call it LRO for short. So LRO was designed to gather information to help scientists and engineers plan a return to the moon, um, primarily with, with astronauts at the time. Um, and the programs have kind of shifted a little bit since then, but now we are back to planning to send astronauts to the moon. So LRO has a suite of instruments that um, are designed to help characterize the surface. Uh, we've got high resolution cameras that take really great images. We have a thermal radiometer that measures kind of the thermal properties of the, the surface. We have radar, we have lasers that measure topography and, and a few other instruments. Um, but a few of the primary goals of LRO were to identify safe landing sites, um, first off for future missions, uh, locate resources on the moon. So like I mentioned before, find areas where we can really mine the regolith for hydrogen and oxygen and things that we can use to produce water. Um, characterize the radiation environment, which is again key for when you want to send humans. Um, learn what the moon's made of. So what are the different rock types um, that are present across the surface of the moon? Um, search for water ice and then uh, figure out how often the moon is actually hit by meteors and um, kind of really get at the impact flux. So back in 2018, um, a lot of the lunar scientists got together and really brainstormed on what are the key scientific destinations on the moon. Um, so where are the places we really want to go next? Um, and this, um, we kind of got together primarily to try and inform a lot of these commercial companies who are looking to return to the moon because a lot of them are, are engineering based. Um, and so we were kind of coming from a scientific side of saying, hey, these are areas we should really focus on. Um, now you can go anywhere on the moon and do great science, but these are just a lot of areas that we've identified as um, really addressing some key questions that we have about uh, the lunar history. And so I'm not gonna talk about all of these because I don't have time, um, but you can see they're spread across the entire surface of the moon, north to south, east to west. Um, there's a few that are kind of are, are more global um, things like you know a geophysical network. So setting up seismometers across the surface of the moon. Um, but I will uh, talk about a few of these um, in the next few slides. Uh, first, we're gonna start with the South Pole because the South Pole is uh, kind of the primary destination we're looking at for the return of humans to the moon, especially for the first few uh, missions. So um, observations from LRO indicate that um, some of these craters near the South Pole, Cabea, Shoemaker, Faustini, um, show great potential for actually having subsurface ice. So again, these are near the South Pole and there's a lot of areas um, near the, the pole that are in permanent shadow. So they never see sunlight, they're incredibly cold and this really allows them to retain um, water. So LRO does have an instrument that's designed to detect neutrons coming from the surface. Um, and so uh, if the presence of hydrogen in the soil actually reduces the number of neutrons um, that kind of escape the surface. And so when we look for these areas where there's reduced um, neutron counts, um, and then that kind of really shows us where we may be able to find um, sources of hydrogen, which may be sources of water. So these really, these blue areas you're seeing here are those, those areas that may have water. Uh, so we're interested in the South Pole, again, because of the water ice potential and the resource potential, really a great area to send humans if you want to live and have, you know, water to, to live off of. 
Um, it's also located, the South Pole is also located near the oldest and largest impact basin on the moon, which would really constrain the, the impact chronology for the moon. Um, and again, technology development for Mars. So getting humans to the South Pole would be a really great place to kind of um, live and work and develop the things we need to, to move on to Mars. Uh, the next one I'm going to talk about is the Aristarchus Plateau. So this area is very interesting for several, region, for several reasons. Um, first, uh, it consists of this large crater, Aristarchus, that you see spinning here um, at the bottom. So this is a fairly young crater. Uh, it's uh, possibly excavated some, some rare volcanic materials on the moon, which I'll actually talk about again in a minute. Um, and then you've got the whole, this whole big plateau area to the north, north, sort of northeast of the crater itself. Um, so this entire area, the plateau and the crater, they ha it has the highest concentration of volcanic units on the moon. So we have pyroclastic materials on the plateau. Pyroclastics are ex uh, products of explosive uh, volcan um, volcanic eruptions. A lot of these pyroclastic areas may have glass beads that have um, water trapped inside. So they're really interesting from like a resource potential perspective. We also have the oldest um, and sorry, the widest and deepest sinuous rill on the moon, which is this little um, kind of canyon looking thing here, um, which is um, it was created by an ancient lava flow. Uh, so, so that's another volcanic area of interest. And then again, the crater itself may have excavated um, some granitic like materials, which are a re really rare type of volcanic product on the moon. Um, and then finally, um, this entire plateau and crater area are located near some of the youngest basalts on the moon. Uh, so again, lots of interesting volcanic um, things to look at here. All right, so moving on, another area that we've um, considered for future landing sites are swirls, which are exactly what you might think. Um, they are these really beautiful swirly features on the surface of the moon. They're just literally these, these high reflectance areas um, and we don't know how they're formed. We do know that they're co-located with magnetic anomalies. So the moon does not have a global magnetic field like Earth does, um, but it does have little like kind of like hot spots of it, magnetic fields. Um, and um, so these swirls are located in those magnetic um, anomalies. And uh, there's a few different formation mechanisms that have been proposed. One is that um, their location within these magnetic anomalies uh, may actually be shielding them from any kind of weathering from the solar wind. Uh, so over time, the solar wind's interaction with the lunar surface darkens it. Um, but if you have a magnetic field that's um, deflecting the solar wind, then we may get these, these really bright areas. Um, there's been some hypotheses that maybe cometary impacts have kind of swirled up the soil and made it look really bright. Um, or maybe that there's some kind of particle sorting going on because fine particles on the moon tend to be brighter than dark ones. Um, but we don't really know and we really won't know until we, we get there with um, a robotic spacecraft or humans. So in addition to being beautiful, they're scientifically interesting. Um, another um, site we're looking at, this is kind of one of those things that's you know scattered across the moon, are um, pit craters. So pit craters are depressions that were formed by the collapse of the surface, um, generally li laying above an empty lava pit chamber. So at one time lava was flowing um, underground, um, now that lava is obviously gone. So we have the empty chambers and these, these holes have just kind of collapsed into the surface. Um, so these are of interest for a few reasons, for the scientific um, reasons um, being that if you can get a spacecraft inside there or you know something like this little tethered rover, you can actually look at the layering within um, the walls and get information on the sorts of lavas that flowed, how much they erupted, um, their speeds, their intensities, and just really give us a lot of information about the volcanic history of the moon. Um, and then from an exploration perspective, pit craters are very um, interesting because if you can get down in there and actually maybe build your base or just like have a place for your humans humans to be, then you're shielded from radiation, uh, micrometeorite impacts, and um, the extreme temperature swings of the moon. So really ideal for like a future habitat. Um, I think this is the last landing site um, I'm gonna talk about. Um, and this is actually, again, a, a few landing sites, um, these areas of what we call silicic volcanism. So on Earth, we do see evidence of volcanic activity that's not quite like your normal, like basaltic lava flows. Like, you know, you go to Hawaii and you see you know, lava that's generally, generally basaltic. Um, but there's another rare type of volcanism on the moon um, that's lower in iron. Um, it's more like materials like granites, like if you have a granite countertop, for example. 
Um, so this is really rare and it's an unsampled type of volcanism on the moon. We, we know it's there because we have a couple of small fragments from the Apollo missions, but we don't really have any like big rocks or, or evidence for the range of silicic materials. Um, so here, this image you're seeing is one of these silicic sites called the Grootheisen domes. So all of the areas of silicic volcanism on the moon tend to have these um, kind of dome-like features where lavas welled up underground and created these, these features. Um, so again, because we don't have samples, these are, these are um, of incredible value to the lunar community. And just showing you another area, this is called the Compton-Belkovich Volcanic Complex. Again, you kind of see a lot of topography here um, for these silicic volcanism, uh, volcanics. And uh, really quickly um, here at the end, I will talk just briefly kind of about the work that I'm doing, primarily the work I'm doing to use Apollo data to inform safe landing site selection. So I've told you about areas that are of interest to go, but we also need to know how to land safely. Um, so I've got a couple of different ways that I'm approaching this. Um, one is looking at all of the um, past landing sites, specifically Apollo. Um, so I mentioned LRO, we have these really high resolution images, which you've seen on all my slides now, um, but we also have images of all of the Apollo landing sites that are high resolution enough that you can actually see the foot pads of the landers. You also see the astronaut tracks. Um, we don't have any weathering processes on the moon to erase these, um, except for solar wind, but that takes um, a lot more time than you know the 50 or so years these have uh, been there. So you can see the astronaut tracks, you see the lander, you can even see the flag. Um, and if you really look, you can actually see that this area around the lander is very bright, uh, much brighter than the surroundings. Uh, this is Apollo 17, by the way. Um, and this bright area is a result of rocket exhaust interacting with the surface. Uh, so I'll go on to this slide. Um, there's a little video that you'll see playing here. Um, when a spacecraft lands on the moon, a lot of dust is blown up, um, so much so that it, it actually hinders the visibility of, you know, your astronauts, if, if that's who's flying your spacecraft. Um, and so this rocket exhaust shooting um, across the soil actually causes the soil to, be, to become brightened. Um, and so my work is looking at why, uh, what are the physical changes that are happening to cause this brightening? Um, it's most likely things like surface smoothing um, or, or some kind of particle redistribution. But we see these bright areas around all of the spacecraft, and we really want to know how big they are um, and what physical changes are occurring. Uh, this is very important for a couple of reasons, one being sampling strategies. If you want to land and get a sample that's completely untouched from the effects of rocket exhaust, you need to know how far away from your lander to go to get these samples. Um, you also want to know what the effects are um, in case you are landing next to something like, like a habitat or another spacecraft. So you don't want to you know, sandblast it, um, say. So I'm looking at how big these areas are, how they scale with lander size, and then how we can predict for future missions um, uh, the kind of damage we'll do to the surface. And then the other thing I'm doing is mapping um, boulder distributions at the Apollo site, specifically around um, craters that we, we know the ages of because we have returned samples from these craters so we can date them. Uh, so, you, so boulder distributions are really key on the moon for a couple of reasons. There's a scientific reason being that over time, um, boulders are impacted by micrometeorites, which causes them to kind of weather away and become just part of the regolith of the moon. So if we look at boulder distributions around craters of known ages, we can get a handle on how long boulders are surviving. So, you know, if you see a crater of a known age and it has no boulders and kind of gives us some constraints on how long the boulders are actually um, staying on the surface. Um, and the other being, we can look at how boulder distributions change as a function of crater size. Um, so, you know, we can then figure out how far out boulders are being distributed as craters vary in size. Um, there's a lot of factors that go into it, but basically understanding these distributions is really crucial for determining our landing hazard criteria for future missions. Uh, so, so both this and the rocket exhaust things are, are studies I'm working on with, with Apollo data. Which kind of really just um, brings me to my last couple of points that Apollo has left an incredible legacy that we're still learning from today, um, not only from the science and the samples, but you know, the things like the spacecraft, what it did to the surface. Um, and the moon really gives us an opportunity to understand different processes that have shaped both the moon and, and the entire solar system. Uh, so I'll just leave this um, quote up here that I really like from Jim Bell about um, exploring the moon. Um, and I'll thank you for listening and open up to questions. Okay, thank you so much for your talk. That was also really interesting and fascinating. 
We have a little bit of a delay to the YouTube channel, but we already have some questions. So the first question we have is, um, do you think the tardigrades from the crashed Israeli mission can survive on the moon? I'm going to go with no. Um, no, granted, I don't know a lot about, you know, how, how they survive, but there, there's no atmosphere on the moon. There's really nothing there to support life. So I'm, I'm going to go with the solid, probably not. That's sad to hear. So I mean, maybe they will, it'd be kind of nice, but maybe I'm pessimistic, but I'm, I'm not optimistic. <laughs> So we have another question. What would be the most realistic material or minerals we could harvest economically from the moon? Um, yeah, so I'm, I, I don't, you know, speak resource harvesting very well, but there are a couple of minerals that, that are of interest. Um, things like, like ilmenite, which has iron and titanium and oxygen. There are different processes to really extract the oxygen and, and, and generate hydrogen and things that you can then use to produce water and rocket fuel. So that's, that's of interest. Um, there's, there's people who look at um, just taking the regolith as a whole and just, you know, generating oxygen from it. I don't know, again, the intricacies of that process. Um, there's some interest in helium-3, again, not something I know a lot about. Um, but, but there's obviously a, a few different things that we can look at. And, and these minerals and rock types are abundant across the surface of the moon. So there's a lot we can do anywhere we go with resources. Um, but again, going somewhere like the poles where there's more hydrogen, more water, um, you can probably do a little bit more in terms of, of things you can live off of there. So we also have a follow-up question basically to this question. So reg regarding resource extraction, are there any international regulations or policies in place to prevent conflicts among countries' corporations? Yeah, um, there, there are like a few treaties. Again, I couldn't tell you what all the language is, um, but in short, like no one owns the moon. Um, and there is, I think, some work being done in our administration right now. I haven't followed it very closely um, to basically legalize um, things like mining on the moon. Um, and then there's something set in place just to to avoid any big conflicts, but but there's no, you know, no one has laid claim to any particular region on the moon. So again, there are some treaties to kind of, you know, navigate some of this, but essentially anybody could really go land anywhere um, on the moon. So one question is how big are the impacted areas around the landing site approximately? Yeah, they're about, it depends on the size of your spacecraft, um, tens to hundreds of meters for the Apollo missions is on the order of about 100 to 200 meters um, kind of going out from the spacecraft. Um, if you're looking at, this is really interesting. I wish I had the slide showing it. Um, things like, um, the, the Blue Origin Blue Moon Lander or the SpaceX, uh, what is it, Starship, uh, I think they're calling it. Um, those are gonna be much, much larger. So those are gonna be big issues. Uh, but yeah, for, for the Apollo missions, it's about 100 or 200 meters, depending on which mission it is. So one question is, would you, did you do you personally want to go to the moon? I would love to go to the moon, um, yes. You know, 2024 is kind of close. I'd love to be the first woman. I don't know if I can make that, slide that one in, but yes, I would love to go someday. Okay, we have a very spicy question. So oh. I am all for lunar exploration, but my wife isn't. What would you say to convince her that lunar exploration is worth the tax money? Yeah, um, I would say that we, we don't go to the moon just to, to answer some fun questions that we have about the moon, but we actually also go to the moon to learn about our own planet. Uh, so there's a lot of things that, that tie in between kind of the earth and the moon. Um, we share possibly a similar history. Um, again, this is there's formation theories that suggest that the moon was, was once, uh, or basically was generated from an impact with earth. Um, so, so there's really a lot that we can learn about the moon that will inform um, the history of our own planet in terms of impact history and evolution and, and different things like that. Um, and then from kind of an exploration standpoint as well, um, you know, we're often looking to go live off of our own planet because, you know, one day we're going to deplete our resources. Um, the moon is the easiest place for us to get to. It's our nearest neighbor. You know, why not go? Um, it really helps us prepare for other places like Mars. So, so again, we, we look at the moon because it is scientifically valuable in its own right, but it also really tells us a lot about our own planet. Okay, so I think now that we're not only learning about science, but also are saving potentially a marriage, that's a good point to stop. Thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in to our first online event. And we hope to see you soon at Science Distilled or Astronomy or Tap again.